I'll be sharing 18 things I've learned in my 18th year of existence. The reason why I wanted to do this episode was because I am turning 19 in about three days and I feel like this year, my 18th year, has been a year full of growth and a lot of learnings Um, and I think that's very much due to the fact that I was kind of swept from my high school setting that I was so comfortable in for like six years and moved into a completely new setting with university and then everything that comes along with being a young adult I guess in terms of working and figuring out finances and then also figuring out who your friends are and your goals and your aspirations and where you want to go in life so there's a lot of different things um, that I think occurred at this point in time it's been such a crucial period of learning and growth and I think I have a lot to share but before I get into the 18 things I've learned I want to just encourage you all to subscribe to the channel if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, I'm going to be posting a lot of video content in the next few months, so a lot of video interviews with some incredible guests, and then also some more one-on-one videos like this one. Be sure to subscribe, like, share, comment, all those good things, Um, and if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else where you listen to your podcast, be sure to follow me or follow the podcast on those relevant platforms and share them as well so you can keep up to date with all new content that's coming out and also follow the telltale podcast on instagram at the telltale podcast that's at the telltale podcast i'll also put all the relevant links in the description of this episode on youtube and the relevant pages so if you missed any of that in that really quick little spiel there you can check those out in your own time But as I said before, we're going to dive right in and get into these 18 little learnings for the year. So let's get into it. So the first learning um, of my 18th year is that it's really important to not settle in friendships. Don't hang around people who don't make you feel included or accepted. And this is something that I think I've always known, I guess, and I think it's not too much of a like crazy thought-provoking insightful learning Um, but it's something that I think became more apparent to me this year because moving into university I wasn't with my high school friends I was chucked into a new pool of people from different walks of life and different backgrounds and some people that I met had come into university with existing friend groups and existing friends and I sometimes didn't feel included I didn't feel Like, I was a part of their groups. And that's not a bad thing. That's probably just because, obviously, they feel most comfortable around their groups. Um, And I feel like if I'd come in with my school friends, I'd probably have stuck with them too. But I think as an outsider looking in, you want to be doing what's best for you and you want to be hanging around people that make you feel included and who actively check in or invite you to things. Um... I think that's super important and yeah finding those people that make you feel included is a really important thing to do definitely don't hang around people who make you feel excluded that's just a very common thing and I think it's just important to remind yourself of that and be wary and and aware of your situations and the social settings that you're in to make sure that it's actually benefiting you the next learning of the year is that you should only hang around people who actively show you that they want you there and make the effort. And again, this is very much not really a separate learning, I guess. It's very much intertwined with the first one. But just make sure that the relationships that you have and the friendships that you have are not constantly one-sided. I think sometimes you can have friendships where you are constantly giving and you are constantly checking in on them and you're constantly, you know, planning things and they're not really reciprocating that and I think in those situations it's super important to reevaluate the relationship and really think about and consider how much you're giving and whether that is being reciprocated and I don't think it's a selfish thing to do that I think it's important for you to surround yourself with people who match your energy and who similarly care about you the way that you care about them because the danger is that you give away all your energy and you just feel completely drained and I think in friendships you need to be uplifted if it's feeling draining then it's not a healthy relationship and you need to figure out how to kind of get out of that situation or maybe just communicate the way that you're feeling to that friend 
because in some cases it can be fixed just by mentioning it because sometimes people aren't aware of how they're making you feel or how their behaviours are being perceived or, or received. Do you know what I mean? I think us as humans, we aren't always conscious of how we behave, how our behaviours affect other people. Some people are very much aware of it, but others aren't. So it's important to try and communicate it if you do want to salvage that friendship. But if you've kind of had enough and you feel like maybe even after communicating it, nothing's changed, then I definitely think it's important to potentially distance yourself or just, you know, move on. The next learning is that if you ever feel like you're giving more in a friendship than you're receiving back, it's important to stop. Um, again, this is very interlinked. These All, all these learnings are very interlinked, I think. Um, but sometimes in the absence of your support or your advice and your presence, these friends have the chance to reflect on how much of a positive impact you have on their life or, you know, how much you were giving to the friendship. And I think with time and space, people have time to reflect. I think when you are in a friendship where you're constantly giving to another person, they never have the time or never take the time to reflect on how they're behaving because they feel like they can kind of get away with those behaviours because you're still kind of giving them the same type of energy. Um, but I think once you remove yourself from the situation a little bit, people can actually reflect on, you know what, like that friend was such a positive influence on my life or was such a constant in my life and I wasn't, you know, there for them in the same way. Um, so I think, yeah, cutting yourself off or distancing yourself is sometimes a positive thing um, if you feel like after communicating your, your issues or concerns, nothing's really coming out of that. I think as well, this is just a tiny thing, but also in friendships where you are constantly in conversations, asking questions, checking up on them, or trying to initiate conversations, and they never ask back or never kind of reciprocate in that same manner, um, they just will spend the time talking about themselves talking about their issues, ranting to you, almost kind of like dumping a lot of their baggage onto you, but never taking your advice or never reciprocating in terms of asking back and checking in with you and how you are. And I think especially on that point of not taking your advice, of course, some people, I mean, of course, people don't have to take your advice, right? But I think if a friend is coming to you constantly with an issue and you are taking the time and the energy to like, provide them with advice and give them some sort of, you know, direction on how they can go about it in the future, but they just continually ignore your advice and just want to rant at you. It's kind of like a thing of, so why are you coming to me? Do you actually want advice or are you just here to like dump all of your issues onto me? Like I'm some sort of punching bag for you. Do you know what I mean? And then never reciprocating in terms of checking in with you. I think that's quite a toxic cycle and quite a toxic pattern something to be aware of because I think that is also incredibly draining with relationships and friendships it's important for you both to be there for each other um, but to also acknowledge but to also be able to take constructive criticism it shouldn't be a one-sided type of thing um, in a friendship at all so that is another learning I think another thing that I've come to learn or come to realize at least is that you shouldn't tolerate disrespect from a friend, regardless of whether they can be nice to you sometimes. If they're ever making you feel disrespected, and that's consistent, that's a consistent pattern, you need to leave the situation. I think if you feel disrespected at times, but you communicate that and they fix their behavior, again, there are ways around these types of issues. But if you've communicated how you feel about something, how you felt disrespected in a situation and they continue to disrespect you in that same way, regardless of the fact that they can be really nice to you sometimes and can be really caring and they have redeeming factors, you cannot shield them from the fact that they are disrespecting you. Do you know what I mean? That doesn't compensate for the disrespect. And I think sometimes people get trapped in, again, these toxic relationships or toxic friendships, toxic situations, because they constantly are like, oh, but like, she's really nice to me sometimes, or he's really nice to me sometimes, or they're really nice to me sometimes, um, or they care about me, or they buy me things, or they go out with me, or they invite me places. But if they're disrespecting you, if they're 
you know, crossing boundaries, if they're calling you names that you don't feel comfortable with, or if they're just bringing a lot of negative energy into your life. I think you need to acknowledge those. You cannot allow those good behaviours to compensate for the bad. Um, so it's just an important, It's Im- I think it's just important to acknowledge those issues and and don't let people get away with things just because they're nice sometimes. So yeah, basically those questions, a lot of them were basically saying you need to distance yourself and cut yourself off from certain people and I think that's something that I'm learning to do and it's something I always used to find really difficult because I like people and I want to see the good in people and I think sometimes, yeah, you can kind of just, you know, self-sabotage by surrounding yourself with people um, who aren't actually good but you are constantly trying to just see the good if you know what I'm saying. The next learning, the fifth learning, is be friendly with everyone, but don't be friends with everyone. And this one was a really hard one for me to learn because I love meeting new people, as I said, and making new friends, but I think it's so important to protect your energy. That's probably the biggest overarching learning of this year, protecting your energy, because you won't be able to care and give properly to your friends if you have a lot of them right like it's basically if you have for instance five really close friends you have probably more energy to give to each friend and more time to devote to each friend than you would if you had like 20 30 50 friends that you know like it's hard to split your energy evenly across the board and so some people will get neglected or some people who don't deserve the energy as much as others you know the the imbalance there Um, so yeah something I'm planning on doing more I think moving forward is diverting my energy towards you know my closest friends the people that have always been there for me and it's not that I haven't you know been or acknowledged the fact that I have those closest friends I always have but I think because I'm a person that's very friendly and I've had a lot of friends in the past um, I haven't been able to divert as much devote as much energy to those closest friends um and so yeah moving forward it's something I'm continually working on it's a gradual process you can't just you know completely change in in a second but it's something you need to gradually work towards and that's a goal of mine you know and so there's also this kind of like little mini checklist I've been drafting up as of late to kind of differentiate between a friend and an acquaintance because I think they're two different things but I think in the past, myself and other people that I know get them confused. They think that an acquaintance is a friend. They consider an acquaintance a friend. And I don't think that that label should be given as, as easily as it, as it is. I think friends and call, considering someone a friend is such a special thing. And so, yeah, it's important to be able to differentiate them. So here's my little, I guess it's not really a checklist. It's a little kind of descriptor that will help you more clearly define a friend from an acquaintance so I think that a friend I'd say are constants in your life they're people that are consistently there or people that you consistently or regularly talk to and interact with Um, I think that they are always quite consistently there for you they check in on you or they care about you as a person Um, and then I think as well you also get along outside of the uni work kind of context so you know you're not just a circumstantial friends you also catch up outside and you also check in on each other outside of a work relationship um, or a uni relationship or a school relationship or wherever you have met Um, and then you also share similar interests or enough ideas values attitudes um, that you can get along in that way and I don't think it's important for you to have the same interests attitudes ideas and values as your friends but I think it's important for you both to share similar kind of ideas or or ways of approaching things for example you can have different ideas from a friend but if you're both open-minded people you both like discussing things you both um are open to listening and engaging in conversation I think that that is a really healthy relationship and you do share something in common by having those similar kind of ways of approaching discussions or ways of approaching um, the friendship, if you know what I mean. But I think if you clash in terms of those things, if one person is really open-minded and the other isn't, or 
those little kind of subtle things, I think that's when you kind of have to reconsider things. But again, with like the similar interests, I don't think it's necessary, but I think it's helpful to have similar interests or attitudes or ideas as the people around you, because obviously um, you want to cultivate a safe space um, and connect yourself with people that are like-minded and, and focused and driven in the same way that you are. But yeah, again, it is good to have some differences. I don't think you should be exactly the same as your friends. I think that that can cause issues um, because then that becomes an echo chamber. So you do need to have subtle differences here and there. And I think that that also just helps you expand your worldview and and learn from your friends because you're different, right? Um, but I just went on a little spiel there. We're going to move now to an acquaintance, what I define as an acquaintance. And I think that that is someone that you don't really keep in contact with regularly so you only talk now and again like very very briefly as well those conversations aren't really anything substantial um you only really see each other circumstantially so you only really see each other in a work setting or at university or at school or in an organization or in a soccer team or wherever you've met this friend or I mean this acquaintance you only really hang out with them in the context that you've met them or you see them most often if that makes sense so you don't catch up outside of that and then I'd say you don't really share much in common or talk about things any talk or talk about anything besides the shared subject or school or job that you have and so basically by that I'm saying like you don't have any kind of anything in common or anything to talk about besides the circumstantial setting or context that you both share because then that's not really a friend right that's just an acquaintance someone that you see at university or work and you get along within that setting in that context but it doesn't really blossom into anything else outside of that context if that makes sense so yeah back in the day I think I would consider people like that a friend so if I met someone at school and we only talked about, you know, our, the same subject that we shared and we got along in that context, I would consider them a friend. But I think now at university, um, I think because I'm not with people as consistently as I was, a friend for me is someone that across the board I see consistently or I talk to consistently or is still in my life regardless of the fact that we don't share the same context. Um, we're not just like circumstantial friends, we are friends. Um, so yeah, I think it's important to differentiate the two for sure, because then that also allows you to define who your friends are from your acquaintances. And then with the friends that you have kind of identified, you can divert and I mean, not divert, divert you can devote your energy appropriately. The sixth learning is the importance of voicing your concerns or thoughts rather than repressing them. And this one is just pretty, I guess, self-explanatory. It's important to express your concerns I think I just used to be very much to myself with my thoughts or my concerns on things I wouldn't voice them because I don't like drama I hate drama but I don't think that voicing your concerns starts drama and if it does start drama then whoever that concern involves or whoever that concern is related to probably has an issue of their own that they need to fix and if they have an issue with it and they can't um you know discuss with you or, or really engage with you in a conversation about the issues that you have then maybe that's not a person or a circumstance or whatever that you really want to be around so I think it's just important to voice your concerns and be constructive obviously with your concerns don't just like tell someone that like you know you hate them or something um if you have issues with a person express them and I think most of the time I've realized that it doesn't start drama. It usually actually ends up in positive change occurring. So yeah, voice your concerns, express your thoughts, be open and honest. Being honest is the most refreshing thing. It just makes you feel so alive. It's a weight off your chest. Trust me, it's something that I've been doing so much more often this year. I've not been like repressing down my thoughts and opinions and things. I've just been open with them and it's given me so much freedom so much freedom I could cry <laughs> um but yeah the next lesson the seventh lesson is that insecurities are a form of self-obsession in my opinion and the reason why I'm saying this is because no one really cares about you that much to pick out or notice all of your flaws right 
you are more concerned with your flaws than anyone else because you are you, right? You look in the mirror and you see a pimple on your face and you notice that pimple because it's you and you over kind of exaggerate the horrors of that pimple on your face. Um, But then when you go to a friend and you're like, oh my God, I hate this pimple. Most of the time, like friends are like, I didn't even notice it. Well, at least in Mike's case, I've had friends approach me and they're like, I've got this big pimple in my face. And I'm like, I did not notice that pimple until you pointed it out, right? Because in our heads, we are our own self, worst self-critics, right? We're, we're our own worst critics. Um, so we just exaggerate things and we pick out flaws and we focus on the really minute things that we don't like about ourselves. But to people on the outside, they don't really care. And the reason why they don't really care or they don't really notice the flaws that we see ourselves is because they themselves are also suffering from the same issue that we have. Everyone cares about themselves, right? Everyone is self-obsessed to an extent, even if it's not like some crazy level of self-obsession where it proliferates in terms of like being an absolute egotist. But everyone cares about themselves and notices things on themselves more than other people because we're all in our own bubbles, we're all in our own little worlds. So I think recognising that and recognising that you will notice your insecurities more than anyone else is really helpful. And I'm working on that because once you're able to acknowledge that, that's the truth. Because it is the truth, I'm telling you right now. Because that's the truth, I think once you learn that and you can overcome that, it allows you to live so freely. It allows you to feel so liberated. To know that no one really cares as much as you care about yourself, right? No one's really watching or judging you as much as you think they are. You have this thing in your head that everyone cares about you and everyone cares enough to hate on you or hate or judge you, right? But no one does, right? Like, it's it's just our minds messing with us. Our minds are our own worst critics. So once you are able to realise that and acknowledge that, you can feel so liberated and so free. You can just live your life and not feel, you know, susceptible to the views or influences of others because it doesn't matter, like, no one really cares. No one cares, like, honestly, no one cares. Live your life, enjoy yourself, walk out, and if you have a pimple in your forehead, no one cares as much as you will about it, like, it's normal. That pimple is normal, it happens, everyone gets pimples now and again. Um, So, yeah. I also think that, you know, you can still be insecure about things, but gaining the ability to go about your day, realising that no one cares is the truest form of confidence, in my opinion, because I don't think that anyone is truly 100% confident. You know, you can point out a really confident person, but I don't think that they are 100% confident. They still have their insecurities now and again. They're just either really good at masking it or they can push them aside because they realise that no one really cares and that like life is too short and that you've just got to move and and enjoy yourself and make the most out of your experience. Um, So what a confident person has been able to really master is the ability to ignore external opinions and truly live because you can't truly enjoy life if you're constantly caught up in what you think people will think of you, right? Um, If you just stop preempting whatever you believe that someone's going to believe about you, which is when I'm explaining that, it already sounds like absolutely ridiculous, right? So once you stop trying to think about what other people will think of you, you're going to have the best time. Trust me, I've been practicing it and I've been having the time of my life because I've just been doing things that I enjoy that make me happy without caring about what people could potentially think. And most of the time, they don't even think what you potentially think that they could think. That sounds like a tongue twister, but again, it's just so topsy-turvy, so silly, right? Um, But yeah, that is the seventh learning and probably one of my favourite learnings, I think, of this year. The eighth learning of this year is that when you're nervous about something, you should ask yourself, realistically, what is the worst thing that could happen? And then, once you do that, you want to compare the worst thing that could happen to the best thing that could happen. And I think that that can help you rationally pick out any insecurities that you have or any fears or irrational fears that you have and be able to move forward. 
So for example, when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about signing up for something, if you're running for something. So I think this year I wanted to run for this position um, in the Law Society. This was at the beginning of the year. It was like a first year law rep thing. And I was so intimidated about it because one, I didn't know anyone really well. Um, two, there were some great candidates up for the same role as me. Three, I just didn't want to face the embarrassment of not getting in, right? Like it just, I was putting myself on the line and I didn't want to embarrass myself like that. So in my head, the worst thing that could happen was that I wouldn't get in. My name would be on the ballot sheet. Everyone would remember me as the girl who didn't make it in to first year rep. But then the best thing that could happen is I get that role and I'm able to fulfill it and and have a really good time and meet people and you know hold cool events or whatever and between the two right the best outcome was really I feel like it trumps basically that little embarrassment right because the embarrassment that I felt I would have in my head in reality wouldn't actually occur right it's again my head my mind playing tricks on me right because if I didn't make it into that role one there'd probably be other people that didn't make it as well right we'd all be in the same kind of pool. And then two, no one really cares anyways. Like these little voting things and like little, I guess, social settings that we're in. I think for an individual, everything's amplified because when you're in that setting, you can't remove yourself from the situation and see objectively how it actually operates. But in reality, now that I've finished my first year, no one really cared about who went for the role, right? Like, no one really remembers it. They remember the people that got in, and that's cool, but they don't remember the... Like, they don't care about the fact that someone didn't make it in. Then You're not going to get bullied or anything like that if you didn't make it in. I think, actually, it's more of a testament to your character to be able to push yourself and go for a role. Um, and so I think, actually, in turn, the worst thing that could happen is actually a good thing. It's a learning curve, right? You went for it. You tried... I think it's always important to try things regardless of whether you get in or not and I think um yeah pushing yourself out of your comfort zone is a win so to be fair honestly the worst thing that I thought could happen would have actually been a win in a way because I would have pushed myself out of my comfort zone tried something new regardless and then obviously the best thing would be would have been that I got in and I did get in so again it was just my mind playing tricks with me right um but even if I hadn't gotten in I think it would have been a win for me um so that's an important, I think, learning in a very roundabout way. Ask yourself what the worst thing that could happen is and then compare it to the best thing that could happen. And then I think something that I should add is that with that worst thing that you thought could happen, try and spin it in a way where it's a positive. And most of the time when you're nervous about something, it's because you're running for something or you're trying out for a position or whatever. Usually the worst thing that can come out of that situation is you didn't don't get in but in reality, going for that position and just giving it a go, I think, is such a win. Such a character, you know, so telling of your character, I think. So telling of your grit and determination. And the more things you try for, the more opportunity that you have to get in or to win in the future. I think um, some of the best people have tried things and lost in their lives. It's character building. Uh, so go for it. Um, this also... I kind of covered the ninth point with that eighth point but the world doesn't stop moving even if you're unsuccessful and people forget things really quickly they don't remember they don't remember at all like something will happen now and you know maybe you'll get embarrassed for a few months right but after those months the year, after those few months after a year after however long no one's gonna remember no one cares because this links back to our other point where we're saying that everyone cares about themselves. Everyone's so focused on what they're doing and their lives and, and everything that's going on in, in their kind of situations that if you lose something a year ago, they probably won't remember. They don't care enough to remember. And I think if they do care enough to remember something that you lost like a year or two ago, that probably means that nothing's going on in their life and they have some issues and insecurities that they need to work on because they shouldn't be obsessing over you and your losses so much I think that's a bit toxic right so just live your life give things a go um and expand your mind and your horizons um 
and it's for the plot like everything's for the plot if you lose it's for the plot right make your story super interesting um because the win that you get um and the opportunities that 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 kind of thing could present for you are also for the plot so just go for it go for it is basically essentially what i'm saying so hopefully that's been helpful i think because that's a fear that i think a lot of people have getting nervous about things but yeah it's a mental a mental jump that you have to make to help yourself just go for things without any fear of of pushback the tenth thing that i've learned is that cafe food is expensive it's so expensive it's expensive right like especially in the city you can go and you'll order things that are like $25 a pop, right? One off purchase, that's that's fine. It's reason like not reasonable, but it's it's fine. It's whatever. But cumulatively, it's a lot of money. I don't recommend going to cafes all the time. And if you follow my TikTok at Kayla Emily, I'm also at Kayla Emily on Instagram, if you want to follow me there. But if you follow me on TikTok, you know that I have been cafe hopping recently quite a bit, and it's something that I'm going to be stopping next year. Because as I said, cafe food is expensive and cumulatively it adds up. Um, So something I want to do more is is definitely budget a little bit better. And I think it's important to note that just because you have the money to spend doesn't mean you should spend it, right? Like, I'm like in my head, like, I have money to spend, like, I can buy this and it's fine. But it doesn't mean you should spend it. Because long term, right, like, you want to be able to save up and and provide some sort of financial security for yourself and obviously like the money that I earn is good but it's not what I will probably be earning in the next few years I'll probably be earning a lot more than what I'm earning now but you know regardless if you start saving from now it's a lot better than not having any savings from your young adulthood right so that's definitely a consideration of mine um definitely looking to start budgeting and stop splurging in the new year (laughs) But obviously, I say this with a grain of salt because it is the holidays at the moment and I will be splurging just a little bit before coming to this stringent period of my life. So bear with, you will still be seeing a lot of cafe content in the next month or so because it's my holidays. But I think once I get back to uni, there'll be a lot less cafe splurging and a lot more being savvy with money and probably eating stuff from home or stuff that's a little less expensive (laughs) the next learning number 11 i love the number 11 um is that the most aesthetic cafes and restaurants often have the worst tasting food and this is so sad right because i love being in beautiful spaces i love being in really nice cafes restaurants bookstores shops whatever it is they just create a really nice ambience and Um, a really nice vibe and I feel chilled and relaxed especially if I'm studying in a cafe or whatever it is Um, but a lot of the time they don't have the best food you go to like some dingy little corner shop and they have the best food sometimes Um, but obviously for the sake of vlog content that I've been doing or foodie content it's been fun to explore some different cafes but definitely note that a lot of these beautiful looking cafes don't always have the food as on par as the aesthetics make sure you check out those dingy little cafes that are close by because sometimes they have the best food sometimes they are hidden gems don't judge a book by its cover essentially learning number 12 is that you can attract opportunities when you're operating on the right frequency what i mean by this is that when you are focused when you know what your goals are when you're slowly working towards them, when you're, you know, doing things that are putting you in a position that will help you reach those goals, even if they're small, I think in those periods of time where you're really motivated and you're really focused and you know who you are and you know your direction, that's when the best opportunities come. I think they just float into your life and it seems almost magical and mystical, like, oh my god, right timing type thing, but it's usually because you were on the right frequency and I think by you know, doing little things that help you achieve your goals. You're going to meet more like-minded people, more people that will potentially be able to offer you opportunities that are aligned with your goal and your vision. So I think it's super important to put yourself and position yourself in the right way to get to your goals. 
Um, obviously, I'm talking very vaguely here because everyone has very different goals and very different things that they go they want in life. But I think for me, I would say maybe in terms of career or my aspirations for the future and the type of person that I want to be, um, I just kind of, I guess, explore different avenues that are aligned with my passions and my interests. And from those little things that I join and those little, um, you know, places that I go and attend, I meet a lot of people that are similarly minded or I meet a lot of people who are kind of pursuing similar directions and then from those people and from the experiences that I learn I find new experiences where I meet new people and I meet you know people that can help me you know on my journey and I can similarly help them and opportunities just pop up but they're not magical they're not mystical it's because you've aligned yourself and you're operating on the right frequency so I definitely think that that point is very true the 13th thing that I've learned this year is the true importance of giving yourself structure or routine. And this is mainly because in high school, it was so normal to have that routine and that structure. It was consistent. It was laid out for me. I had my timetable. I knew where I was going every day. It was a nine to three consistent kind of routine for me. Um, but only until I left high school was when I realized how much I relied and thrived off of the routine. I loved having structure. It just gave me direction. It gave me purpose. I knew where I was. I knew where I was going. You know, everything was laid out for me beautifully. But in high, in, in sorry, but in university, things are just so different. Um, your schedule and your timetable changes all the time. Um, you're not even on campus every day, all day. It's usually quite, you know, random sometimes. Um, you have work as well. And then you have, you know, people to catch up with or some people go partying, some people want to enjoy their social life and do other things, extracurriculars, whatever it is. Um, so I think I've just found it really important for me to be able to create structure for myself. And I think being responsible with that, trying to maintain some sort of structure or routine every week has helped me get back into, into the flow of things a little bit more. Um, so... For me, I love Google Calendar personally. I'm a Google Calendar advocate, but I know some people use things like Notion or they just write down in a diary. I think diaries work well too. But basically, I plan out my week on Google Calendar. I, on the Sunday of the upcoming week, I sit down for maybe like not even that long. It's probably like 10, 15 minutes at most, at most. And I basically just like section off events for whatever I have on that day so if it's a class or if it's a you know study session or if I need to study certain points of the day I just you know allocate it accordingly obviously give yourself time for breaks or for lunch or whatever it is or for catch-ups and so forth um, but just planning it out blocking that time out helps you gain a little bit more structure and routine and know where you're going and feel more organized and productive with your days because it's super easy when you don't have structure to just sit down and relax and not do anything. I think that I've been victim to that many times this year. I've just, you know, I haven't kept my schedule up to date and I've just, you know, lied on the couch all day on TikTok, right? Um, so having that structure has helped me get back into my, not grind mode, but my productive self. And obviously you don't need to stick to that structure either. It's not rigid like it would be in school. It's a lot more flexible because you own it and you have the opportunity to fulfill it. But I think by creating the schedule every day, you feel more responsible and more inclined to stick to it because you've actually like taken the time to work on it. So the importance of structure is another learning. The 14th learning is that people come into your life for a reason, but some are just simply little cameos. And I think that this is so true. I take every person that enters my life as a learning, I think. Um, I love meeting new people. I love learning from them and hearing their stories and, you know, especially when a friend is supportive back and, and also cares about you and is interested in you. It's always nice and you always feel really comfortable and safe and so forth. But I do think that some people aren't meant to be in your life forever, right? You can meet someone that you absolutely adore and you consider such a close friend of yours but it doesn't mean that they're going to stick around and you can't hang on to them. I think it's important to let them go if they 
seem to be wanting to go off on their own, right? And then that same thing with yourself. If you feel like you are noticing toxic patterns or you just feel like you're becoming a different person from them, I think it's very natural for people to go apart, especially after you after high school. Um, people go apart very easily. But I think even in terms of uni, like from SEM 1 to SEM 2, the friends that I had in SEM 1 are very different from the friends I have in SEM 2. And I think that's just because naturally, you know, life happens so quickly and so much happens, especially in a young adult's life, that you can just grow apart. Um, and it's harder to maintain friendships, honestly, in, in university because you're not constantly circumstantially around each other. You have to actually make the time um, to catch up. So, yeah, it's normal to go apart and some people are just cameos. They come into your life for a certain period. They make it really bright and they, you know, they decorate your life with a lot of happiness and and a lot of fun. And then they go about their way, like just in like a TV show, right? Um, and you've got to let them go. You can't hang on to their little cameos, you know. You've got to, um, you know, just appreciate the main characters in your life, the constants. Um, and, you know, let the cameos go if they want to, right? So, that's the thing. I think sometimes it's been hard for me to let people go, um, especially even if I've noticed toxic patterns, and that's kind of linked to the four where I was saying don't just allow people to compensate their bad behaviours with the good, um, but I think it is important to let people go um, if they want to. The 15th learning is the true power of curation on social media. This is a big one for me, I think, because partly it's partly to do with studying media, but it's also partly to do with my vlogs and the way that people perceive me solely off of what I post, which is only like a small glimpse and, and it's heavily curated. Um, but I've had a lot of people who watch my vlogs. I'm saying these like they're like super big. I don't have a huge following. I just really enjoy making them for myself. I think it's fun to chart some of the really fun experiences that I've had and to chart the friends that I've had. And I guess it'll be nice to really watch back all of the little video diaries that I've recorded and uploaded in the future to kind of, I guess, capture those experiences. Because I think that videos and photos are such powerful reminders of different times and in our lives and different periods. And it just recounts a story in a way. But um, it's also proof as well for my grandkids or, you know, anyone that precedes me. Um, they can be like, this was my, this was my grandma. This was my great, whatever it is. But um, anyways, that's me justifying why I do it. But I'm basically talking more so about how people perceive them. Um, when I'm creating my vlogs, these are TikTok vlogs for reference. At Kayla Emily, if you want to follow me. Again, shameless plug. But they're like... Either they range from 15 second clips to like maybe a minute at most. I don't really make vlogs that are longer than that because I know that with TikTok, people's attention spans are so short that they won't sit through a one minute video or like anything longer than a one minute video. And sometimes they won't even sit through the one minute, which is crazy, but I've noticed it just from, you know, analyzing some of the stats. Um, and I'm not caught up in the numbers. I don't think I am, but as a media student, it's always interesting for me to observe the algorithm and observe the um, way that people interact with the content and I noticed that they dip off after probably the 15 second mark so that's a really good indicator of the attention span that society has at the moment because of TikTok. Anyways it's a very small glimpse of my life right one minute is supposed to recount 24 hours of my day right and that's barely anything it's very short clips sometimes it's not even of the experiences sometimes it's like a stagnant picture of the wall or like a stagnant image of me and my friends right like it's not a real indicator of my life and it's a very small glimpse and I don't vlog you know my work I don't vlog when I'm studying I don't vlog moments that are personal and private to me um because that's just boundaries that's just not what I'm willing to share and it's not because they're bad things a lot of them are amazing things but that's the thing like I want to keep those moments sacred and private um you know not everything needs to be shared online and then on top of that with studying and working I just don't think it makes for entertaining content obviously some people like to see them but I prefer to just post fun little vlogs because that's what I like to watch as a viewer of other people's TikToks 
But again, it's a very small glimpse, but I've had people, basically what I'm trying to get to is I've had people come to me or come up to me and message me and they're like, wow, your life looks so incredible. Like it looks amazing. You're always doing something super fun all the time, which is not true at all. I have my days, I have my slump days. I don't do anything sometimes. Um, you know, it's just very highly curated and it's not intentional. It's not me trying to brag like, wow, my life looks so amazing. It's not that at all. I just want to capture the really fun moments so I can look back on them. Um, and then also, as I said, some things I just like to prefer, I prefer to keep private. Um, but I guess from an outside perspective, what people see, they just think that my life is like amazing all the time and it's not, it's not. And that's the power of social media, I think. It's just really amplified the power of social media to me and the fact that, you know, what you're seeing online isn't real because I know it isn't real as someone that's creating content. So I can imagine that, you know, the people that I look up to as content creators are also in similar positions. They're curating their posts. They're making them look perfect. They're, you know, well, I don't think I make my stuff myself look perfect intentionally. I think I just record what I find fun. But again, like it's not about the intention. It's about the way that other people perceive it. And it's like art, right? Like everyone has subjective opinions on things and everyone perceives things in different ways. So some people could think that I look perfect. Some people could think that I'm trying to create this perfect image. Some people could think that, you know, I'm lying or something, you know, villainize me. But genuinely, I can genuinely say that I just really enjoy filming content. Like I find it so fun. And I think because I'm a media student, it's so fun to engage with social media and to play around with it and to play around with editing and recording and charting my experiences as a video diary and I'm not concerned with the numbers I don't have that many followers right so that's not really a big issue for me I just enjoy following I mean I just enjoy having fun with it and I think that a lot of people enjoy watching them too from what I've heard so I'm like if people are enjoying it then that's just a pro of it right and I'll keep creating the content as long as people enjoy it but even if they stop enjoying it I probably would still try and create that content as long as I had the time um, and I do think the next year will get a bit hectic for me second year and I have a lot of other things going on so we'll see how long I can maintain it for but I do hope to do so the next learning the 16th learning is that friendships and relationships in your life shouldn't feel forced they should be easy because I think if you're finding it really difficult to discuss things with your friend or bring any of your concerns to a friend they're not changing um, or you just feel like there's a lot of negative energy and you are constantly trying to uplift the energy and, and change things in a positive way and you're facing pushback, I don't think that that is a healthy situation to be in. And you should remove yourself from the situation, move on with your life, have fun, you know, surround yourself with people that make you feel good because life is too short to be, you know, caught up in a friendship that isn't serving you, right? Do, do what's best for yourself honestly. Um, but obviously when you're doing the best for yourself, make sure that that's not having any negative ramifications on anyone else around you. Um, but yeah. 17, we are almost done, but the importance of setting time out to reflect is a big one for me on yourself, on your life, on how you feel. Um, and I think it's because, I mean, I think the reason why this has become so apparent to me it's not because I haven't been reflective in the past. I have been reflective. Um, and I am quite a reflective person, but I think sometimes life moves so fast that you forget to check in on yourself. You forget to take time for yourself, especially if you have a lot of friends like I have had in the past or you have a lot going on and you're very busy. It's hard to just stop and check in on how you're feeling, you know, where you're at in life. Um what your goals are, what you want to do moving forward. Sometimes you can just get so jaded by what's happening in the moment that you forget to really step back and look at your life objectively and look at your behaviours objectively and correct any toxic behaviours that you have yourself or call out anything that you feel is wrong. I think the best people are able to reflect as well. I don't think you need to be perfect to be good, right? I think good people are reflective people. Good people are people that take time to reevaluate the decisions, reevaluate the behaviors, and fix them moving forward. I think if you can't reflect on your behaviors or your own toxic patterns, then you're not a good person to me. Personally, personally, 
I don't know, is that controversial? I don't think that's controversial at all, right? Because if you can't reflect or you can't fix yourself, then you're not really a good person in my eyes, right? Because you probably just think you're perfect and you have no flaws. And I think that that is a danger. That is a harm, right? Because you could actually be hurting a lot of people by thinking that you're perfect when you're not. So I think it's important to pick out those toxic behaviours. And I don't think that anyone is void of any flaws. I think everyone has flaws in their personality or in the things they do. Um, I think that some people are just better at reflecting on them and fixing them. And it's a process of continually learning what your flaws are, learning what, you know, isn't perfect about yourself and fixing them as you go. It's not like a linear thing. It's not going to, you're not going to become a perfect person overnight, right? And I don't think you'll ever become a perfect person, but you can become a really good person. You can become the best version of yourself by just fixing those little, you know, things that are out of place. <laughs> the little untidy things about yourself. But yeah, I find reflective people so inspiring. It just shows a lot of maturity and a lot of growth. I think mature people reflect. I think immature people can't reflect and they can't point out any flaws with themselves. They can point out flaws in everyone else, but they can't look inwardly. And I think that shows a lot of immaturity. My final learning. This has been a very long video. I've enjoyed it and I hope you have too. And I hope you've learned a lot. But if you've stuck all the way to the end, welcome to the final learning. And this is that I still have so much to learn. Hopefully that wasn't an anti-climax, but I do. I genuinely have so much to learn. I don't think I'm perfect at all. I think I have flaws and things that I need to work on and improve on. And I figured that most adults don't really know everything, right? Most other adults that are around my age or older that I've interacted with since, you know, moving away from high school, I think most of them don't know everything. They don't know where they're going. They don't know their direction in life, particularly or specifically. They're kind of just moving with life. And, and taking lessons and taking things as they come. Um, everyone's just winging it, basically. Like, everyone's in the same boat, you know? But that's the beauty of it, right? If you knew everything, life would be boring. You'd never learn anything. You'd never be able to grow. Um, so I'm just really excited to learn more as I grow up and become older. I'm only 18 right now. I'm sure that if I watch this video back in, like, 12 years, I'll be like, baby, <laughs> you're an absolute baby, right? You didn't know what was coming for you and hopefully everything that's coming for me is positive though right I'm hoping that 30 year old Kayla if you're watching this video you're having the time of your life you're living the life that we've always dreamt of and hopefully my current self can make you proud and, and build you know us up to the person that I do want to be at 30 um but yeah I'm just still learning obviously and the learnings that I've had in these this 18th year of my life obviously aren't, you know, extensive, but they're little things that I think could also be quite helpful to anyone watching this video. Hopefully you've learned something and can take something away from it. But thank you so much for watching. Thank you for sticking with me. I'm super, super excited to get this podcast back up and running properly. This is only the beginning. Um, I've got some awesome interviews lined up and potentially some more individual content I'm thinking of doing a little uni advice type video soon as well because I know a lot of my little high school friends are moving towards uni now which is exciting um, but also it's a very daunting time period so I'm here to give you some advice and to share some wisdom and hopefully some sort of you know comfort in these times in these trying times but thank you so much for watching be sure to subscribe like comment share um, Follow the Instagram of the Telltale Podcast at the Telltale Podcast. That's at the Telltale Podcast. For any business inquiries, be sure to email at telltalemedia at outlook.com, I believe. And I'll put that down in the description as well, just to double check. And any relevant links as well down there. But yeah, thank you so much. Enjoy your day and I'll see you next time. Bye.